Well, hello everyone and welcome to today's seminar. This is the third in our two-part virtual series on participating in Australia's carbon markets to meet your corporate climate goals. I hope you're all well, uh, wherever you may be joining us from today. Um, this series, as many of you have attended live each week, uh, has been developed to increase your knowledge of carbon markets here in Australia uh, and the international developments afoot, as well as introduce you to some of the key market players uh, and most importantly, highlight opportunities available for you to engage uh, further in the market as you look to achieve your corporate climate goals. So today we bring you our third and final seminar in series two, a series which has been all about carbon market strategy, trading and procurement. Uh, today's focus will be on international carbon markets, and we'll share with you some market perspectives and practical insights from our panel of brokers, traders and developers currently active in the international marketplace. So as you can see on the slide that's just passed, it's been quite a journey we've had together over the past few months. Uh, and it has been a real privilege here at the Carbon Market Institute to be able to deliver this series uh, and bring you all together to learn, engage and interact uh, each week with our panellists on various topics, market initiatives and developments underway. And today is no exception. It's going to be another great opportunity for you to hear from industry experts and ask questions of our panelists. As always, the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen is the best way to get in touch with us here. Uh, so please send through your questions anytime uh, during the seminar today. We'll get to as many as we can during the live Q&A, which will follow each of the presentations. Uh, and we can also provide you with written responses uh, and share relevant links for further information during the session. Um, the upvote, uh, has proven to be popular. So if someone asks you a question before you do, just feel free to like it and we can know it's trending. Now to access any of our prior seminars uh, in this series, recordings are being made available for a period of time on our CMI website. Just head over to our Carbon Conversations page to revisit those. Uh, for those in Melbourne, very deep in the stage four COVID restrictions, um, feel free to take a break from Netflix and binge watch this increasingly popular series. I heard that it's very educational and fun. Uh, but in all seriousness, it's really a great resource for you and your teams uh, and anyone wanting to find out more about how carbon markets operate, uh, why and how organisations are getting involved and where opportunities are emerging for further market engagement. So let's dive into today's topic. Uh, I'd like to introduce you to our panellists today. We're very pleased to be joined by Tom Spooner, uh, who's Shell's Australian Carbon Market Lead, Lloyd Vars, who's the Head of Carbon Trading at WEACT, and Jay Van Ryan, who's the Head of Climate Strategy Oceania at South Pole. Uh, Tom from Shell is going to kick things off today uh, and take us through how Shell is engaging in international markets and some of the key drivers for engagement. Tom, thank you for joining us today from Singapore. I will hand over to you now uh, for your presentation. Well, yeah, as I said, good morning, everybody. Thanks for giving me the opportunity to uh, join the seminar and um, finish off the series. Um, so I'll tell you a bit about how and why Shell is engaging in international carbon markets. Um, and let me give you a little bit of context on Shell quickly before we, we dive into, into that. Um, it might surprise some of you to know that the Shell name and logo actually held back to the foundations of the company when a, a London antique trader started importing and selling shells <coughs> from the Far East. And this was for interior design usage in London. So Shell didn't start with oil and gas at all. And um, Shell's always been in rather more diverse and evolving types of activities than a lot of people think. And today we have a, um, an upstream and a downstream and, and a trading and supply part of our value chain. So in the downstream businesses, we're supplying the world with, um, with energy and fuel products, um, lubricants, chemical products, environmental certificates, um, and energy solutions such as um, home solar battery storage solutions, really quite diverse. And in the upstream, we are producing unrefined oil and gas energy from renewable sources and investing in um, carbon capture and sequestration, both geologic and also uh, nature based sequestration. And in the middle of the value chain, we have um, a trading and supply business which connects those different groups of companies in the upstream and the downstream with the world's energy commodity markets and also um, does business with lots of other third parties who need to buy or sell energy commodities or, or deal with the risks or the challenges they're facing in those markets. Um, the bottom line is that Shell actually supplies about 3% of the world's energy consumption. And with that goes a large carbon footprint, of course. Now, just a few words there before we start from my legal team. Basically, what this says is um, this conversation touches on the present, but they're 
will also be touching on the future and any forward looking statements are just Shell's expectations about the future. They may or may not come to fruition. So I'm obliged to warn you not to place undue reliance on those forward looking statements. So now we're into the kind of interesting part of the presentation, I hope. And um, first, why we engage in international carbon markets. And um, a key thing that triggered this um, following the Paris Agreement a few years ago, Shell first announced its um, long term uh, emissions intensity ambitions, climate change ambitions. And um, uh, that's a key driver for why we're, we're engaging in international carbon markets today. It's also a, a cornerstone of Shell's strategy to thrive in the energy transition. Um, and Shell is today um, is evolving towards a product mix which is um, lower lower carbon intensity and um, it's important to note that not only is this a, a long-term goal but we also have short-term goals over the next couple of years which uh, need to be hit and the pay of our executives and a good sort of 20 percent of Shell's global workforce is linked in part to these near-term emissions intensity goals so as we shift to lower carbon products we are using um, voluntary carbon offsets against our net carbon footprint ambition and to help our uh, our customers decarbonize their energy use we're also using voluntary offsets for our own corporate travel um, but we're not using offsets for our own emissions from our own operations at the moment as we do see and we are pursuing opportunities to um, uh, avoid and reduce emissions before we turn to offsets and something that sets Shell apart actually from some others that, that buy or sell offsets is that we're on the same operational decarbonisation journey that many of our customers are on. And we, we promote the approach of avoid, reduce, compensate emissions to our customers as well. So offsetting is intended um, for emissions that are intrinsically hard to, to tackle with current infrastructure, but not necessarily the first port of call. I know there are probably some uh, energy customers of Shell Australia and our subsidiary ERM Power tuning in and you can work with Shell as a partner in, um, of, in reducing and compensating your emissions and you can just ask your key account manager about that. Uh, so a few more reasons why Shell engages in, in international carbon markets. Now we, we're really interested in the Australian carbon market. We love that market but um, when it comes to international markets, the topic today, suffice to say that um, when you are looking as a global company to procure millions of tonnes of, of abatement a year, that volume is more easily found um, when looking at the international market as a whole rather than any individual domestic carbon market. Um, cost of abatement is a more <clears throat> interesting question because I mean, some people think that low cost offsets are, are a bad thing for the environment. Um, but from a from a oh sorry I moved on. Let me move back. Bear with me. From an economic and uh, environmental perspective, um, it makes sense to widen the scope of abatement and uh, channel whatever funds are available to the, the lowest cost abatement opportunities so that those those finite funds that individual and collective uh, corporations and consumers have achieve the greatest overall impact in terms of abatement if we're just talking about um, greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so long as the environmental integrity of the offsets is is sound, then it logically makes sense to um, widen the abatement scope and cost of abatement opportunities globally therefore are, are attractive to us. Integrity, I just mentioned, um, you have to be selective in the international market, but we, we've done sufficient uh, checks on some of the key market leading standards. Um, and we only promote certain standards. We don't promote um, international voluntary offset standards where we don't have faith in the, the integrity of that abatement. And we also do specific due diligence on, on projects. A lot of international carbon markets come with certified uh, or the projects come with certified co-benefits and we know that's important to to our customers and in international 
um, contexts, those those co-benefits are, are real and they're certified and they're linked to UN Sustainable Development Goals. And um, there's an opportunity to have an impact on a, a great many lives of people who can benefit where where those goals are pursued. <clears throat> so, um, I mean, Australian projects also certainly claim co-benefits and, and perhaps a certification of those co-benefits would help their attractiveness as well in the international context. Lastly, of course, international diversification is attractive because carbon markets are a regulatory construct and there's, there's a risk with each jurisdiction that something might, might change that affects our ability to buy or sell credits. So we're diversifying that risk. So I'll now tell you a bit about how uh, Shell is engaging in international carbon markets. And we, we, we transact in those markets via a, a central trading team. And that, that's been established for um, 15 years, but we, we've picked up activity a lot more in the last five years. Um, this team manages Shell's requirements and our customer requirements in both compliance markets and uh, voluntary schemes. You can see a lot of the compliance markets there on the map and then the voluntary schemes are, are global in nature. Um, some of the benefits of having a, a central trading team um, and even though we have locations, four locations currently and we have people in each location and indeed we're also looking at, um, we've got plans to put a small team in Australia and that, that'll be coming probably as soon as the COVID-19 situation allows it. But even though we're, we're spread out globally, we can pool our expertise and our resources together. Uh, we can coordinate our approaches to market to, to reduce the risk of one part of Shell bidding against another part of Shell in the market. Um, and we, we've created a, an internal culture and an internal mandate um, which sees which is externally focusing and it sees carbon markets and carbon pricing as not just a risk to be managed but also an opportunity for commercial innovation and partnership and um, even though we do some innovative things it's important to say that we need robust operational and functional support and um, that kind of expertise we have with some specialist expertise to support this specialist activity for a, uh, a central global team so that's that's how we that's our market interface to these markets basically. Trying to move on. There we go. Uh, this is just a, a peek at our global offset portfolio, which, as you can see, is rather diversified. And uh, that's all the Australian. That's all the projects outside Australia. And we do also deal extensively in um, Australian projects. And our new energies business has a couple of small projects, one in human reduced regeneration. We have we have some energy efficiency projects as well. And um, the new energies business was also very pleased to announce recently it will acquire Select Carbon and eventually integrate Select Carbon into Shell. Uh, that's one of the leading land based um, ACU project developers and suppliers in Australia. So. This is my last slide. Um, things that we look for when acquiring international offsets, and these are considerations that shape how we how we engage in international markets and um, recommendations for, for others as well. So project portfolio helps avoid concentrated exposure to single projects and suppliers and the, the potential performance risks that go with that. Diversification of project types, um, carbon standards and jurisdictions. Slightly different point. Um, there are sort of, you know, underlying underlying risks that go together with each project type or, or standard or, or jurisdiction, um, which are separate from um, supplier performance risk. And that's we, we feel that's especially important currently as there are a number of unknowns in how international trade of, of different offsets will be uh, organized and accounted for by different countries from next year as the Paris Agreement article, well Paris Agreement basically becomes operational and the Article 6 framework for that um, is agreed towards the end of next year. Um, but like other people in the industry, we're 
looking ahead to see how that plays out and um, positioning our, our portfolio accordingly. With a um, with a portfolio as well, of course, you get get a range of, of co-benefits and so that spreads the positive impact on local communities and biodiversity and habitats more, more broadly. Um, due diligence is, is an important thing, which probably a uh, later speaker will, will come into in more detail. And we, we, we have a, um, a range of technical capabilities in-house, um, which we can borrow from other parts of Shell to, to do some really in-depth in due diligence, also media screening. And then we don't just do that at the beginning of a relationship with the project. We also do that on an ongoing basis to ensure that projects continue to meet the approved carbon standards and claims. And, and basically there are there are projects that Shell wants to be associated with and has the integrity that we require. And um, we, you know, we also look to continue to grow this portfolio. As the portfolio grows, all those benefits increase. And uh, on that happy note, that's the end for me, so I'll leave it there. Thank you, Gloria. Thanks, John. That's a really great overview of the uh, markets that you're operating in and also the diversity of projects that you're involved in, um, which I think speaks a lot to the, the management of risk, as you mentioned, when it comes to engaging in markets. So thank you for those insights. Um, I'd now like to introduce Lloyd, uh, Lloyd from WEACT, who uh, work across carbon markets globally, uh, ranging from project origination through to commercialisation. Um, Lloyd is coming to us today from sunny Queensland. Um, he'll share with us some of his insights on corporate participation in voluntary markets, uh, some of the key risk management considerations and the importance of due diligence. Uh, so welcome Lloyd, over to you. Thank you Gloria and good afternoon everyone. Uh, my name is Lloyd Voss and I'm the head of carbon trading at WEACT. Uh, before I get into the presentation, just a quick uh, quick um, background on WEACT. Uh, WEACT are a leading international carbon project developer and trading desk. Uh, we were established in 2009. We're headquartered in Melbourne. Um, we have offices in India, Colombia and South Africa as well. So in a sense, we do uh, trade the global carbon market. On average, we trade about uh, seven to 10 million tons of uh, carbon per year. Um, and as carbon offsets are a regulated financial product in Australia, we operate underneath an Australian financial services license. Um, so today I'm going to just give you a bit of a brief update on the drivers of the, the voluntary carbon market, uh, both uh, internationally and in Australia. Uh, we often get asked, you know, what is driving corporate voluntary demand? Because it certainly is on the up. Um, and if I can give you a really kind of a short answer, uh, a bit glib, but it's actually quite true. It's the Greta effect. Um, as you saw, you know, there were quite big protests last year. Um, this uh, issue of climate change is becoming more common, commonly discussed in the media, in the social space, um, and, and businesses are, are catching on to this. Um, I was at the COP in Madrid in, uh, in December of last year, and there were actually more people uh, in the squares of Madrid protesting against climate change. Um, and, and, and wanting to see action on climate change than there were uh, within the, uh, the conference itself. So if you are, I guess, a forward thinking CEO and you're thinking, you know, what does my business look like in 2025 or, or 2030? Um, you would be thinking and you would be asking your board, you know, what must industry do to prevent a broad social backlash? Uh, and the answer to that really is to get on the right side of this megatrend. Um, to really understand it, really embrace it. Um, I'll just read you a few quotes because they're quite interesting. Um, this, the first one is from Bernard Looney. He's the chief executive of BP. And he, he stated that um, we're aiming to earn back the trust of society. We've got to change and change profoundly. Um, in Australia in, in June, uh, Twiggy Forrest, uh, of Fortis, Fortescue uh, Metals, uh, he brought forward a promise to achieve net zero operational emissions by 2040. And in, um, in July, AGL, which is Australia's biggest polluter, they signed up to a 2050 target and, that, and they said they would also tie the pay of their top executives to climate related goals. So you can see how big business is starting to engage actively in the, uh, in the climate change space. And they're doing that through, uh, you know, in, in some sense through the purchase and investment in carbon offsets. Um, as Tom was saying, you know, big emitters are now looking at ways to turn this, uh, turn this risk into a business opportunity, which is great. 
Um, internationally, we're seeing that the oil majors such as Shell, BP, and Total, uh, even Puma, uh, they're looking at uh, establishing carbon funds uh, and using those funds to invest directly into carbon abatement projects um, with a real focus on nature-based solutions in the land sector. Um, so that's really good to see the, the flow of capital into the space. Um, and in, in Australia as well, you know, Qantas has their Future Planet program, AGL, as I just mentioned, and a num num number of other corporates are moving along the journey to uh, to setting targets and decarbonizing their operations. So that's all uh, that's all well and good. It's good to see that uh, that transition happening. Um, another question we get asked is, um, how do corporates engage in the voluntary market um, and do so? in a way that manages their risk. So the, the risk management is quite important. Um, and the answer to that really is to, um, you don't wanna be buying carbon offsets off the screen. You don't wanna just buy credits, you know, kind of indiscriminately. You wanna have a good um, understanding of the project from which those carbon offsets originate. Um, and you wanna have a line of sight to those projects so that you can do the due diligence on those projects. Um, so there's a couple of models and I'm sure Jay's gonna go into that at, in a bit more detail in his presentation. Uh, but the first model would be a direct investment. So a do-it-yourself approach. So that would be the company actually making a direct investment into a carbon asset and then owning those credits from that from that carbon project. Um, another way of doing it is to purchase carbon offsets from a project developer like ourselves, um, where we have uh, management of the project or uh, a relationship with a project owner such that you still have direct line of sight to the project and, and an understanding of the project and an understanding of the offsets that uh, those projects generate. So um, I'll leave it there for now. Um, I guess that's a brief overview of, uh, of, of what we're seeing in the voluntary market. Demand is certainly up, uh, which is good. Uh, corporates are, are increasingly engaged in the space. Um, and I look forward to answering your questions in more detail in the Q&A. Thanks, Lloyd. Um, great to hear from you, as always. And um, for our audience members here, please keep your questions coming through and we'll get to them following our next and final presentation. Um, I'm pleased to welcome Jay here from uh, South Pole, one of South Pole's penguins. Um, South Pole is a global organisation whose presence in Australia includes a range of uh, climate, carbon and energy services. I'm sure Jay will go into more detail about those um, in terms of helping uh, organisations with their carbon neutral goals and investment in carbon offset projects. Um, Jay's going to share with us his perspectives on the growing voluntary market as well today uh, and the various options uh, for procurement and trading, as Lloyd mentioned earlier. So welcome, Jay. Thank you, Gloria. Uh, Gloria, and thank you as well to the CMI team um, for for having this series running. It's been it's been great um, to have this type of communication regularly coming out to the market and just lots of live updates right this market is constantly moving constantly changing constantly innovating so i think this is a really has been a really good platform for for the entire audience and, and and industry participants to kind of keep up to date as things are moving um so quickly uh, as well i would like to acknowledge uh, the traditional owners on all of the lands today through which we meet uh, here in, in, in Melbourne, uh, I'd like to um, pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging of the Rwandri people of the Kulin Nation. And today I'd like to talk to you about net zero ambition and the role of carbon markets. Um, and great that Tom at the top there outlined Shell's net zero uh, sort of overview. And I'll, I'll touch on a little bit on, on what that looks like with other industries as well. A little bit about South Pole. Um, we assist businesses to manage their climate risk and take advantage of the climate action opportunities um, available to them. Uh, we do that globally on a global stage. And uh, here in Australia, we have a couple of offices, Melbourne and Sydney, and then dotted on the major markets all over the world. Um, the areas on the map here shaded in green are where our carbon projects are, and we are the largest developer of carbon projects globally, and it presents a great opportunity with uh, the discussions that we have in the market to look at new and novel ways to procure carbon credits and uh, meet their, their net zero strategies. Um, as Lloyd mentioned as well here in Australia, um, dealing in Australian financial uh, products such as Accus, you need an Australian financial services license as South Pole does. Um, we're also a signatory to the CMI code of conduct um, for 
carbon, the, the carbon industry here in Australia. Um, we're a climate active, carbon neutral uh, business, and we're also certified B Corp as well. So we do all of that because it's all super important to engage in a meaningful and tactile way in the industry to deliver as much value as we can to, to our clients. So what I want to talk to you about today is a split into two categories, the net zero ambition and, and carbon markets. I'll explain where we're at <laughs> with tracking towards a net zero economy. Who are the leaders and, and so what are the platforms that uh, the corporate and industries are using to, to get down their net zero um, pathway? Uh, why carbon credits? So there's a lot of things you can do to become, to get to your net zero position. So why carbon credits? And what are your options with carbon um, procurement as well? So first with net zero ambition, we got to we got to come back to back to the science for a moment. We've got a big task ahead of us. Uh, we, the global economy, um, us in the in the industry, which is we've got to do something we've never done before, and that's turn the emissions ship around. Rather than increase emissions year on year, which we're really good at, we've actually got to decrease year on year, and that's what the IPCC uh, has been telling us for a long time, and especially so in the the, the special report on 1.5 degrees. That's the graph on the left, and here today, 2020, that's where our emissions stand, and sliding steeply is what our emissions emissions need to do out toward 2050 to have a net zero position. But the story doesn't stop there. We've got to keep on going down to negative emissions out to the end of the century. So it's a big task. And the pledges and commitments through the Paris Agreement so far aren't enough. We have an ambition gap. The graph on the right shows us our historic emissions, which we all, we all know, and the, the shaded uh, light gray boxes there actually look at the pathways of where our emissions will head even in the current um, Paris pledges that have been acknowledged. So that ambition gap has to be closed by business first and by nations increasing their ambition, doubling down their commitments. So what are businesses doing? There are There has been a lot of activity in the carbon market in the last 12, 18 months. Huge, huge uh, rise in participation and Lloyd touched on a lot of that as well. How is it happening? Who's doing it? It's spread across these major claims going out there in the market. Carbon neutrality, net zero, climate positive, carbon negative. In Australia, we are so fortunate to have the Climate Active Standard, which is the certified carbon neutral pathway owned by the Australian Federal Government. I was going to put some logos up here of, of brands that are certified carbon neutral under climate active but i thought it's not about how big you are um, to be the you know climate active um, uh, certified carbon neutral or how small you are it's actually that you've done it whether you're big medium or small it's a really important process to go through and it's the most robust and most transparent carbon neutral program in the world so it doesn't matter if you're the local school or one of the biggest brands, corporates in Australia, to have been certified carbon neutral by Climate Active is a massive achievement and it's a really important step in our net zero journey. Globally, uh, I've put up McKinsey and Signify. Signify is um, Philips Lighting, they've rebranded to Signify. I put them up as examples of um, you know, major multinationals also taking the stage around carbon neutrality and demonstrating that through emissions reduction and, and carbon offsetting. Net zero is really interesting. And of course, this is this is the mega trend of the industry. Now, I haven't put up any any particular names as to who is net zero, and that's partly because there's not a real definition yet that's like accepted internationally. But what there is, we have several platforms here that show industry coming together in a collaborative approach to achieve a net zero strategy because net zero for the energy sector is going to look very different for the steel sector for the building sector and for the consumer goods sector so the three that i've listed here are just fantastic platforms please look them up to learn more about them because they are open source industry-led collaborative initiatives 
Um, the, the latest being transformed to net zero, has nine founding members, Maersk, Microsoft, Starbucks, Natura and Co, Mercedes-Benz, all coming together to crowd crowdsource their solutions and deliver that so that we can all learn from their experience. And then of course, climate positive, carbon negative, negative is really interesting. It's obviously emerging, emerging trend, an emerging claim, um, very nuanced as to how different brands are going to do that. Um, and I'll, I'll talk a bit about how that can be achieved in the next few slides. So the net zero opportunity for business is clear. Here's another graph. I'm apologetic already uh, for, for more graphs because I'm a trained scientist and uh, that's how I feel comfortable communicating. But the net zero opportunity is simple. The dotted line is the business as, usual, business as usual emissions if we do nothing. The orange line is our net emissions moving down to net zero by mid-century. And what that requires is setting a uh, target for your business that is aligned with science, that is relative to the challenges and opportunities within your industry, doing everything you can and you must on absolute emission reduction, then where you, as Tom mentioned earlier, where we have unavoidable emissions that to change the technology and behavior can't solve for yet, that's the role of carbon credits in the market. So we end up with this balanced out avoid reduction, avoidance and remo removal to have a net zero position. And then the challenge being keep on going through negative territory so that we end up at our uh, eventual position by the end of the century, um, having solved for hopefully climate change and we're living in a less than two degree world. So the few simple steps to achieve net zero, measure your emissions, understand your risks, set scientific targets, create your roadmap, then get to work, reduce those emissions, reduce those emissions, reduce those emissions. What you can't reduce, you need to procure carbon credits for in the short term and then get out there, communicate and lead because it's so important to then tell others what you're doing so that we can keep that momentum up. So on the carbon recurrent side, what, it, what, can, what can you do? Um, how can you get involved? We like to work with our, with our clients and the market in five different ways. The off-the-shelf credits, um, what's available today, exclusive offtakes around projects that are, are yours to, for investment, turnkey projects, which is adding new projects into the market, so real carbon market additionality, bespoke sourcing, where it's coming together to, to kind of have a strategy together around how to meet specific needs, so Corsia compliance is a good example of that, and then carbon, a carbon fund and basically a, 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 a uh, investment and return uh, of carbon credits. So what are the opportunities and considerations of each of those different models? And I'll, I'll show a couple of project examples as well. Off the shelf, fantastic. You can choose from hundreds of projects worldwide. You, when we speak with our clients, we, we can't give them 100 projects to choose from. We, we talk to them about what are, what, are they, what are their needs and we try and narrow it down to a short list. But you can procure these projects spot, so by what's available today at a volume and a price, or in a derivative fashion. So that's taking a either a forward looking uh, position, a multi year offtake using options to to secure um, projects in a more, I guess, sophisticated way. So you can whilst off the shelf is the standard process, you, you can work in that with that project mix in a couple of different ways, which is more than just buy now. You can look at forward forward arrangements and more nuanced ways. The only issue there to consider with off-the-shelf projects is price and availability because it's a moving market. So um, prices will change. And I think we all know that we've seen prices going up uh, lately and availability will be an issue because projects will come and go. So a good example of an off-the-shelf project is um, our new uh, Prony uh, wind project in New Caledonia. It's a great gold standard project, which is bringing in renewable energy to the island to replace the um, diesel burn for normal generator electricity capacity. Um, really cool uh, set of wind turbines here, which uh, when cyclones are in the region and coming around, uh, the, the wind turbines can be quickly dropped to ground 
let the cyclone pass over and brought back up again. A really innovative model and it's a beautiful project. It's, it's one of my favourite and it's a great example of bringing in uh, renewable energy to remote communities. Exclusive off takes. Uh, it's your own project. It's, it's, it's very much like what we see in the renewable energy PPA space. Um, have that whole claim, your project, your opportunity. Considerations though, these can be, there are limited projects out there that have had the pre-feasibility done and are ready for you and they're quite popular. So it's one of those things that if you want to do, you really want to get involved and, and start asking questions fast and, and acting. And a, a great example of that, is the Padang Tika um, Blue Carbon Project in Indonesia. This is a, a project which is going to protect a huge tract of mangrove forest um, through a cooperative agreement with the local farmers. And there's a 200,000 ton plus emissions reduction opportunity from, from this type of project. And we're going to see more and more and more of these types of projects kicking off um, in the next few years. Turnkey projects, these are a bit different to uh, exclusive projects. Uh, exclusive projects are going to happen anyway. It's just waiting for the right person to come or the right buyer to come along. Um, turnkey projects are really ambitious and may or may not happen. And it really is a strategic um, partnership between the project developer, the, the stakeholders and the end buyer. Um, these can only happen with genuine long-term support and you really can claim carbon market additionality with these projects but you do need to be in it for the long term. A wonderful example of this is uh, the Afri African Parks um, Red Plus initiative where there's several large Red Plus projects that are available to, to activate. Um, a lot more work needs to go in with uh, the, the, the various parties to, to get together, um, but the point being here is a meaningful investment to protect wildlife, reduce emissions and improve lives and livelihoods um, with huge emissions reduction potential of more than 400,000 tonnes per annum. So exciting, ambitious, big and, and fundamental to what the market needs moving forward. Then um, bespoke sourcing strategy, design and build your own portfolio, that's really what you need when you have very specific requirements. So um, Corsia, as we all know, has pretty niche uh, requirements for the carbon credits there. So if you've got a big Corsia obligation, you need to think a little bit more strategically about how you're going to find those, those projects, both existing and new. But if you're another big brand uh, that has a specific set of criteria, whether it's a vintage limitation or if it's a methodology limitation, Microsoft is a good example that you know, negative emissions, they want to see uh, you know, carbon and greenhouse gas emissions being removed from the atmosphere. How are they going to do that? Well, you need to look at um, what's available in a more analytical way. It just takes a bit of time, takes a bit of cost to, to do this uh, process, but it's a fantastic way to get a global portfolio. And then the carbon fund. This is where you can get massive volumes of carbon uh, credits uh, and have a certainty of supply. But like any fund, there's a lot of financial and legal due diligence to do, but it's a, it's a new and novel concept that um, is currently operational and we expect to see grow in different markets around being able to invest money for a fixed return of units and, um, and manage your, your carbon strategy in a way that's um, not so much about a particular project, but more just about that certainty of uh, supply and price moving forward. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. Um, thank you, Gloria and CMI for the opportunity and I welcome any questions um, from here. And if you would like to know more, please touch base with us um, with the details down below. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jay. Thanks for that oversight and that overview. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, definitely a lot of work to do and a lot of ahead of us, but great to see some uh, highlighting some examples from big corporates going beyond net zero and, and negative emissions as well. I mean, drawdown um, and removal, I think, are both going to be required in the long term. So uh, definitely need, need all hands on deck to solve our, our, our climate problem. Um, I can see a lot of you have been very busy in the question. Um, thanks for that. And I can see Tom's already started answering um, some of those ones. Michelle, um, I might just ask you for some more um, comments perhaps on some of the questions we're getting around that, the criteria and some of the quality of offsets and how you go about evaluating those. I can see you've got some comments in there about how you go about that. Um, is there anything further you wanted to add on that? Uh, 
question of, of integrity and how, how people can evaluate those credits um, as they look to engage. Uh, Gloria, I don't have a, a lot to add beyond what I put there in, in, the, um, in the answer box, but um, there were, I suppose there were two types of offsets in our world as, as a trading organisation um, in the international market and, and uh, domestic markets as well. Um, I mean, putting aside the requirement for uh, compliance offsets that, that we might have in, in certain jurisdictions where we tend to rely on the compliance mechanism and, and the rules there um, to set the standard for us. Um, when we go into the voluntary market, we it's it's more of a self-regulated, self-policing type of activity, if you like. And um, in the in the voluntary market, again, there are there, there are two types for us. There are um, offsets that we specifically use to offset Shell's um, net carbon footprint, either either Shell's corporate travel or the emissions that directly result from the products that we sell to customers and the way we do the way we offset those emissions is to sell customers a sort of bun a bundled product which is uh, natural gas or uh, gasoline um, or even um, bitumen or, or something which is um, a carbon credit bundled with the original energy products that they had so so we we use enough carbon credits to reduce the full life cycle end-to-end -end value chain emissions and then sell this, this carbon neutral product to reduce the overall net carbon footprint of the products that we that we're selling so in that category where it's very much a shell uh, net carbon footprint equation we are extra careful on, on the due diligence um, and the criteria and we have quite a documented rigorous process that the project needs to go through first for internal screening and review um, and it's not just the the trading business that does it it's a number of um, corporate functions as well before we decide that a, a project or, or an offset is eligible for inclusion into that into that portfolio um, we also can buy and sell offsets more as a, a, a type of market maker activity so where someone wants to sell or someone wants to buy and we're doing that activity independent of Shell's net carbon footprint. The, the customer might use it for their own carbon claims. That's fine. That's up to them. Uh, in that case, we we don't do so much due diligence. Um, we think it's up to the, the customer to do their own due diligence if they're using it for their own um, claims in that case. Um, we are, of course, you know, circumspect about what types of credits we, we want to be associated with. Um, due to certain reputational risks and, and brand risks and things like that. Um, but we, you know, we tend to rely on the verification standards that are there already in the marketplace to do that job. Um, and we don't do a great deal of extra due diligence and approval over and above. Does that help? Yes, thank you, Tom. And I think you also touched on one of the other questions there, which was how do new entrants to international trading evaluate the difference between offsets uh, prices, so offsets that can be purchased for a few dollars versus those that were uh, for tens of dollars. Um, I think you also addressed that in your presentation um, when you mentioned cost uh, not necessarily being associated with environmental benefits. So um, two birds with one stone on that one. <laughs> Okay. Um, Lloyd, question for you. I know we were talking um, a while ago about some of those mega trends and the private uh, equity and investment going into firms now and just seeing that transition in the business environment. Um, there was a question here um, around how corporates create financial returns from voluntary programs uh, in countries that don't necessarily have a strong carbon legislation. Uh, perhaps you can bundle those couple of things together in, in a response around that. It's a good question. <laughs> And it's, it's quite relevant because obviously uh, we don't have a, uh, a mandatory price in carbon. Uh, there's a voluntary market and there's the uh, there's the emission reduction fund um, or the climate solution to climate solutions funds. It's now called, uh, but corporates aren't facing a compliance price on carbon. Um, so in a sense, you know, you can see corporates actually engaging in the space because they see it in a sense that one is pre-compliance so they can actually get ahead of the curve get some experience in the market 
uh, in, expect, in expectation of a compliance uh, carbon price coming in in the future. Um, but in terms of financial returns, um, in a sense, you know, it's, 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 it's a corporate risk management play. You know, these businesses uh, may think, okay, well, you know, uh, how do we prevent a broad-based social backlash? How do we make sure that we're on the right side of the megatrend, not the wrong side of the megatrend? Um, how do we ensure that um, in our sector we're seen as, you know, leaders in the space rather than laggards in the space? And how do we keep our customers happy? Um, if you're in a certain sector and, you know, you're, you're kind of the green, the greener end of that sector and there's another company who's kind of on the, the, the browner end of that sector, if you want to say so, say so um, you know, you might lose customer, um, customer engagement uh, or you might gain customer engagement depending on where you are in that spectrum. So there definitely is value to be had in, in engaging in the space strategically, um, in engaging and in investing in carbon projects that are aligned with your corporate strategy. Um, and looking for projects that have co-benefits as well. Uh, but obviously, you want the emission reductions uh, to move you towards your uh, your emission reduction targets. Um, but you also want to see those co-benefits that come through in the projects. Uh, and and you can kind of um, look at those strategically and say, okay, well, you know, th these are the kinds of co-benefits that we want to be associated with. Um, oftentimes, as well, there's social license, so you might do a project in a certain area which brings benefit to that community, which gives you social license to operate in that space. So there's a number of, uh, I guess, financial benefits and also, I guess, non-financial benefits that can be gained by strategic investment in carbon abatement projects. Great, thank you. And um, Jay, I just wanted to pass over to you now. There's a question here about um, uh, some corporates possibly being hesitant to set uh, net zero targets because of some uncertainty perhaps around where the Paris Agreement's going, um, what's happening in terms of legislation in Australia. Um, are you seeing any of this? I know this question was, it says Lloyd in here and I'll, I'll flow to you Lloyd afterwards for this, but um, how do you see corporates kind of navigating that policy uncertainty when it comes to either setting their corporate targets and then the use of markets again to achieve those goals? Thank you, Gloria. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, but in honestly, in our experience, the um, the only organisations that are wor worried about Article Six and the Paris Agreement kind of settling are the national and subnational governments. When it comes to corporates and brands, as Lloyd already mentioned, the the pressure isn't from the Paris Agreement. The pressure is from the consumer base, the staff base, the investor class, and more and more the financial regulators actually so again yes it is sort of becoming a pre-compliance activity net zero and paris um they're kind of different things because the paris agreement got us all together it all it all kind of it all put the end to the debate around is climate change real of course it's real and it it gave us a it gave us a, a platform but the science the science hasn't got anything to do with the, with the politics and the corporates understand the science. They understand, like Shell, they understand that decarbonisation is an incredible, uh, incredibly important aspect of the, the way the business is going to continue to work and how they can achieve um, multiple objectives through decarbonising and having a net zero strategy. So if, if anything, um, Policy uncertainty has just enabled corporates in Australia and, and our multinational clients to kind of write their own uh, future and just say, look, we do want to be net zero. We do want to be aligned with science. How can we help achieve that? And they're just getting on with the job because they recognise that there's just not enough happening at that that Paris kind of global government um, uh, uh, level to get together that more needs to be done. So it's, if anything, it's catalyzing action. It's, it's certainly not preventing it. Wonderful, thank you. Strongly agree. Was there anything you wanted to add to that, Lloyd? Uh, yeah, actually, that's, that's, that's some good points that Jay raised there. I, I would say, um, you know, you don't necessarily have to go jump into the bath with both feet and say, you know, we're gonna be net zero by, by a certain date. I would say start the journey. That's the most important thing, you know, dip your toe in and kind of understand what this means. And what we're seeing with corporates who do that uh, when they do purchase carbon offsets is in a sense, it helps to educate them internally as to what this means. 
And in a market like Australia, where there isn't a compliance um, price on carbon, um, what it does is effectively it internalizes a carbon price for those businesses because they would purchase the offsets in the second year and third year and fourth year and so on. So they would say, okay, look, we're moving on this, you know, uh, emission reduction pathway and we're purchasing offsets, you know, over, over the long term. But as they do that, basically they create a internal carbon price curve. And then what that does internally then is they would say, okay, well, look, you know, in 2022, you know, we're expecting a carbon price of say $10. Um, what if we were to invest in a piece of technology uh, that reduces emissions internally at say $6? Okay, then you've got a make or buy option, right? So what that basically in, engaging in the offset market internalizes the carbon price in these businesses and then drives them to make decisions that they wouldn't otherwise. Um, and it and affects the transition to to decarbonizing their business. So you don't necessarily have to go, you know, all this bolus. You can kind of just dip your toe in and, and see where that journey takes you. That's a good point, Lloyd. Just make a start and, and, and get cracking. Um, uh, Tom, there's a question here around um, looking out into the future, I guess. What are the challenges that Shell faces uh, related to carbon trading in the global market? Um, how are you looking to address those challenges? Uh, and also a question that's just coming around kind of supply and demand. If you've got any um, comments you wanted to make around that. Thanks, Gloria. Um, challenges, I mean, there are there are generic challenges around trading in, in carbon markets uh, internationally, such as um, performance risk of suppliers um, or projects um, such as um, jurisdictional risk um, and kind of all, all the things that we, we sort of talked about needing to do due diligence on in the first place and, and have a portfolio and diversify that risk as a way of tackling it. Um, going forward, um, we are not yet finding that su supply uh, and demand is becoming a challenge for us. I mean, we, we don't yet find that the market is supply constrained against um, our requirements. There at the moment is a little bit of a disconnect, I would say, between the uh, number of um, corporates, investors and initiatives making big announcements um, about um, interest in the international um, in international carbon markets or, or indeed some domestic carbon markets and seeing that actually translating into a, a fundamental shift in the in the supply demand balance that we have now or, or over the next couple of years. I don't personally think it's it's trickled through quite yet. Um, as and when that does that that creates both a, um, a you know a challenge for us to buy potentially but also an opportunity as we're you know we're a uh, integrated company with with an integrated value chain approach to to carbon uh, markets including developing sources of supply ourselves um and we're investing in that capability as you, as you're aware even in australia uh, to be used globally and um we, we've made um commitments about putting 300 million dollars to work over the next few years in investing in the supply side. Um, so we're thinking ahead to the challenge that will come on the supply side. Um, and we're also thinking ahead to the challenges that will come um, around the Paris Agreement architecture, which is which won't be known until the end of next year. Thanks, Tom. Yeah, definitely that uh, diversification and portfolio approach to carbon markets, I think is something that's uh, um, be prudent for people to, to consider when they're engaging. Um, Jay, there's a question here for you from the South Pole around your bespoke projects and some alignment around those um, accredited voluntary standards, red plus gold standards. I might throw that one to you um, just to talk a little bit more about that approach that you guys take at South Pole. Yeah, thanks, Gary. <laughs> um, it's, a, it's a good question and being mindful of time, the best place to kind of answer this from or best position, I should say, is South Pole and um, many other large global project developers uh, are, are a member of something called ICROA, and that's our international um, carbon project developer um, industry body. And ICROA has published a set of industry best practice uh, standards around the types of carbon um, crediting standards to work with, as you've mentioned here, 
uh, Gold Standard and Vera being part of those. So typically we are working, well only, we are, we are only working with those um, best practice um, standards and typically we are seeing huge growth in the Vera and Gold Standard um, project development. We are seeing stagnating um, growth in CDM projects. South Pole's noticed and is responding to a market preference for VCS and VERs and away from CERs and, and that actually comes back to some of that Paris uncertainty that was discussed earlier. Um, and, and as well gold standard projects and getting better quantification of the environmental and social co-benefits that go along with projects both here in Australia and internationally is becoming more and more and more prevalent which is fantastic to see because it's it's not all about just the the carbon abatement it's also about how we can improve lives and livelihoods through that carbon and climate finance thanks gloria thanks jay and lloyd i can see you nodding your head there backstage here was there anything you wanted to add further to that comment as well uh, no i just thought it was a good answer yeah okay <laughs> Wonderful. OK, well, um, look, I think we've gotten to most of the questions we have and we're right on time here. So with a couple of minutes to go, I just wanted to thank uh, all of you, our panellists, Tom, Lloyd, Jay, thanks for your time and insights today. Um, and also thanks to everyone who joined us for the seminar today and for your questions. Uh, this does bring us to the end of our educational series. Um, so on behalf of the entire team here at CMI, uh, I can say it's been really great to be able to, to bring everyone together across the industry from various locations together for this series. Um, whilst we had hoped earlier in the year that we would actually visit you in person uh, across the states here in Australia, um, we've really been thrilled with the attendance and strong following for these seminars every Friday. Um, there's been plenty of interaction, as you can see, uh, and follow-ups between all of you and our panellists um, even following the seminar. So it's been really great for the industry's engagement. Um, I'd like to thank all the panellists again throughout the entire series uh, for sharing their time and insights. Uh, I think the information, presentations and discussions um, are really what made this series and we really appreciate everyone's contributions. Uh, special thanks, of course, to the Clean Energy Regulator where you can access further market resources and information. Um, there's our CMI Marketplace, of course, and the CER Markets Hub, as well as the Climate Active website and our Carbon Industry Code of Conduct website. Um, all of which um, will help support you on your journey uh, and engagement in carbon markets. So do check them out um, and of course get in touch with us here at CMI or uh, indeed any of our panellists uh, from the couple of months that have just passed. Uh, lastly, I'd really like to acknowledge the entire team at the CMI, um, all my wonderful colleagues who have played a role in the success of this series. Um, thank you to everyone. In particular, a shout out to our event coordinator, Claire Reed, who is seamlessly navigating uh, the virtual delivery behind the scenes every week and supporting all our panelists uh, with the presentations in the lead up. So thanks, Claire, you've been a, a real star on this one. Um, so here at CMI, we're just going to take a brief pause before returning with some more Friday Carbon Conversations, our, our very popular live webinars that have kept the discussion going during some of these uh, COVID times um, and discussions on key industry, market, policy, um, regulatory and community issues. Uh, obviously, we're all in the transition here to a net zero emissions economy and I think these Friday Carbon Conversations have been really great and we're continuing to get some really good feedback uh, around that from all of you. But we look forward to announcing our upcoming sessions very soon. Uh, so please keep an eye on your inbox for more information on that and how to register. But for now, uh, stay well. Thanks for joining us and hope you all have a great Friday and a lovely weekend. Thank you. <laughs>